In this video, we're going to prove the arithmetic geometric mean inequality, which says that if you have a bunch of positive numbers a1 through an, then their arithmetic mean, which is this number right over here, is greater than or equal to their geometric mean, which is the nth root of the product of the number. The proof we're going to follow is outlined in Cambridge Step 3 exam 2018 number 5. So what I want to do is start by discussing the different steps so that if you want to try this yourself, you can, and then we'll discuss a solution. So the first step is to make a relationship between the following expressions. That k plus 1 times the difference of the k plus 1th iterate of the arithmetic mean and geometric mean is greater than to k times the kth iterate of that, if and only if you have this inequality satisfied by this quantity right here, which relates the k plus 1th element of the sequence, to the kth geometric mean. Now you can think about this as plugging in lambda k into a function. That function is x to the k plus 1 minus k plus 1 x plus k. And then establishing that that function is actually non-negative. So if you get the non-negativity, you get this inequality right over here. Now the non-negativity happens and the function is actually 0 only when x is 1. And you can use that combined with what you prove here to piece together that you have this inequality and to show that equality holds if and only if all of the entries of your sequence are actually equal. It'll be beneficial for us to think about our sequence as an infinite one consisting of positive numbers, a1, a2, a3, etc. onward, and then thinking about the arithmetic mean and geometric means as two sequences of numbers indexed by the natural numbers n. Okay, so if you want to pause the video, give this a try, trying each of these steps, and we'll discuss the solution. So first, let's look at part one. I'm going to start with this expression, and what I'm going to do is rearrange it so that this is on this side. So we're looking at the expression k plus 1, a k plus 1 minus g k plus 1 minus k times a k minus g k. Now, k plus 1 times a k plus 1 is the sum of the first k plus 1 numbers in our sequence. Similarly, k times a k is the sum of the first k entries in our sequence. So if we pair these two things together, we're going to be left with a k plus 1 itself. All right, and then that leaves us with minus k plus 1 g k plus 1 plus k g sub k. All right, so we're trying to prove that this is greater than or equal to 0 if and only if this is. So let's start by saying that this is greater than or equal to 0. Since gk itself is a positive number, this is true if and only if ak plus 1 over gk minus k plus 1 times the quantity gk plus 1 over gk plus k is greater than or equal to 0 by dividing by g sub k. Okay, so you might notice something here. We have a lambda k to the k plus 1, and that's precisely this thing right over here. We have the k plus 1 coefficient like we do here, and we have the k here, so it seems like this must be lambda k, and let's actually check whether or not that's the case. So we'll start with lambda k, that's a k plus 1 over g k raised to the 1 over k plus 1, and we'll write it as a k plus 1 raised to the 1 over k plus 1 times 1 over g k raised to the 1 over k plus 1. Now a k plus 1 itself can be written as the product of the first k plus 1 entries divided by the first k entries and we have that raised to the 1 over k plus 1 and we still have this piece right over here. Now the denominator here is g k to the k and the numerator is g k plus 1 to the k plus 1. So in total we get gk plus 1 to the k plus 1 raised to the 1 over k plus 1, which is gk plus 1. And then in the denominator, we have gk to the k raised to the 1 over k plus 1. Right, so the exponent on g sub k in this whole thing is k over k plus 1. Then we have this extra 1 over k plus 1, which gives us 1 as well. So in the denominator, we have gk. So it is the case that this quantity is lambda k itself. So subsequently, this inequality is the same statement as this inequality right over here, which is the inequality that we actually wanted. Great. So this inequality does happen if and only if this one does. And so 
we've dealt with this first part of the problem. Now let's analyze this function and look at when it's non-negative, why it's non-negative, and use that together with these conditions to determine why our inequality is true. Okay, so now let's analyze this function here and prove that it's non-negative and it being zero if and only if x equals one using some calculus. So let's differentiate first. The derivative of this function is k plus one x to the k minus the quantity k plus one, which we can factor into k plus one times the quantity x to the k minus one. Critical points happen when this function is zero, and that happens only when x is one. So we get a critical point at x equals one. Now to classify that critical point, we need to take a second derivative. The second derivative is k plus one times k times x to the k minus one. And so f double prime at one is a positive number. It's this product right over here. And so this thing is a local minimum. Now let's look at the first derivative to get a sense of what's happening with the actual function. So you have two regions, one is before this critical point and one is after this critical point. Before this critical point, our derivative looks like k plus one x to the k minus one. And since x is between zero and one, this value here is gonna be strictly less than zero. So we'll have that the function is decreasing on this interval. Now in a similar light, this quantity here is gonna be greater than zero in the interval one to infinity, so this function is increasing here. All right, so we have this function, and we have a local minimum at x equals one. The function decreases to that local minimum and then increases afterward. So that means that this local minimum for x greater than zero is actually a global minimum. Right? It is the minimum of the function. Now the actual value of f of one is 1 to the k plus 1 minus k plus 1 times 1 plus k, which is 0. So we have that this function has a global minimum at x equals 1 with a value of 0. So the function itself is greater than or equal to this value, 0, and equality happens only when x is 1. And that's exactly the thing that we were trying to prove. So we're happy. Okay, so the final thing for us to establish is why n is greater than or equal to gn for all n. So we're going to exploit this inequality right over here. And lucky for us, for any k, this inequality is going to hold no matter what. And the reason is this happens if and only if this happens, right? And then we establish that this actually does happen because this function is non-negative for positive values of x. Okay, so we have that k plus one, a k plus one minus g k plus one is greater than or equal to k, a k minus g k for all k. Okay, so first of all, we actually know that a one minus g one has to be greater than or equal to zero. They're actually equal. They're both equal to a one itself. Okay, so you can think about this process then as being inductive. So if you assume for some k that a k minus g k is greater than or equal to zero, then this quantity here would be greater than or equal to zero, and if you divide by the k plus one, you get that this quantity here is greater than or equal to zero. So we have this ca cascading effect that allows us to show that a n is greater than or equal to g n for all n. Now we can actually take this a little bit further and show that equality here holds if and only if all of the a sub i's are equal. To do this, let's say that a n equals g n for some particular n. Now we know that the right-hand side of this inequality is non-negative. The reason is because a1 minus g1 itself is non-negative. And then you can iterate this inductively to get that this expression on the right-hand side is actually non-negative. For example, if you want to know that a2 minus g2 is non-negative, you know a1 minus g1 is non-negative. And so from this, a2 minus g2 is non-negative. And then when k equals two, you get because a2 minus g2 is not negative, a3 minus g3 is not negative, et cetera. So the reason this matters is because if you have an equal to gn, then plugging in k equals n minus one into here, you get an minus gn is greater than or equal to n minus one over n times an minus one gn minus one, which is non-negative, 
but this thing actually is zero if these are equal. So this implies this quantity here has to be zero. So that means a n minus one is g n minus one. And in fact, this cascades inductively, we'll get a n minus two is g n minus two, et cetera, up to a two is g two, and a one is g one, but we knew that already. So now if we have all of these being equal, then these expressions are all zero for k between one and n minus one. This being equal to this actually means that this expression on the left is zero because when we rearrange this expression to have zero on the right hand side, that expression actually identically is this expression right over here. Okay, but the only way that this expression is zero by our analysis from here is if this lambda k itself actually equals one. So as a consequence from this, we get that all of these lambda k's are one for k equal one up to n minus one. So let's analyze what that tells us. So first of all, let's write down what the expression lambda k is for k from one to n minus one. So by our analysis, all of these expressions have to identically be one. So let's look at this part right over here. If this is one, that means that a2 is the square root of a1, a2, because this expression here is one. And if we square, that means that a2 squared is a1, a2, and so a2 is a1. Great, now let's look at this expression. This here has to be one. That tells us that a3 is the cube root of a1, a2, a3. Cubing, we get a cube, a3 cubed is a1, a2, a3. And since a1 and a2 are the same, this tells us that a3 cubed is a1 squared a3. Dividing by a3, we get a1 squared and a3 squared are the same. They're both positive numbers. So we can add a3 to the mix as being equal to all of these. And the same thing happens inductively if we wanted to go about it rigorously establishing that all the AIs are actually equal. So this is a cool way to prove the arithmetic geometric mean inequality and also establishing when equality holds using this inequality paired with an inequality that allows us to use a function and calculus to understand when equality actually holds and why non-negativity holds. So I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, definitely click the like button. If you wanna see more videos like this, subscribe to the channel.